Good day and welcome to Nature's Returns, Investing in Ecosystem Services, a webinar speaker series hosted by the Yale Center for Business and the Environment, or CBE. These webinars address the growing importance of ecosystem valuation and investment, and each unique presentation is recorded and available on YouTube and Yale iTunes U afterwards. We're very excited to share news of a new partnership between CBAE and the Conservation Finance Network, or CFN. CFN seeks to accelerate land conservation and restoration through financial tools and strategies. By providing training and building a network of professionals across the conservation, finance, and philanthropic sectors, CFN increases the financial resources deployed for conservation. This new partnership with CBAE will provide original content and share timely news, events, and online resources on conservation finance. My name is Olivia Sanchez, and I will be your host for today's webinar, titled Large Scale Landscape Restoration, the Investment Case for Ecological and Regenerative Farming. Today with us, we have Paul McMahon, the co-founder of SLM Partners, an asset management firm that focuses on sustainable agriculture and forestry. SLM Partners manages an Australian beef cattle fund that has acquired and that operates more than 1 million acres of grazing land in Australia. Paul has previously worked at Climate Change Capital and McKinsey and Company. He has published widely, including the 2013 book, Feeding Frenzy, The New Politics of Food, he is also the author of The Investment Case for Ecological Farming, a major white paper released by SLM Partners in January 2016. Paul holds a BA from the University College Dublin and a PhD from Cambridge University. So before we begin the presentation, we would like to remind our listeners that questions are welcomed and will be directed to our speaker at the conclusion of the talk. You can type questions directly into the GoToMeeting chat window. And with that, we welcome Paul to Nature's Retar Returns. Welcome, Paul. Uh, thank you, Olivia, and thank you for the kind introduction, and um, I'm glad that all the listeners uh, could be here as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to giving you my views on, on this topic of uh, the investment case for ecological and regenerative farming, or a new era, if you want to put it an acronym. Um, it's something we've been working on for the last seven or eight years. Um, and what I want to do today is, is talk about a, a three or four different things. So the first is go over some of the hidden risks of, let's say, conventional industrial farming systems and the benefits of taking a more ecological approach. Um, second, explore ways in which um, uh, you can invest uh, in these kind of ecological farming systems. Um, third, I'll drill down into a particular case study, a, a $100 million strategy that we're developing in Chile in South America, which is focused on sheep production. And then fourth, um, I'll briefly touch on the 2020 initiative, uh, which is a um, NGO coordinated initiative that we're part of uh, in South America. Um, but just in a way to, to sum up, I think, you know, what, what uh, the argument I'm going to try and make over the next sort of 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll, we'll pause for discussion. The argument I'm trying to make is that um, there is a genuine um, uh, investment case for, let's say, more ecological farming systems, and it's it's one that stands in its own two feet. Uh, we believe it doesn't require um, subsidies um, nor um, policies necessarily, nor sophisticated environmental payments or markets. We think um, the economics actually stand uh, stand up um, uh, in terms of pure profitability and risk just returns when it comes to managing operating land. Um, we think you can create uh, and generate market rate returns while also having some really positive environmental impacts. So it's a truly sort of win-win approach uh, to land management, and that's what gets us um, so excited. In terms of who we are, uh, we are an investment management firm uh, established in 2009. We focus on sustainable agriculture and forestry systems. Um, as Olivia mentioned, we, we currently manage an Australian uh, beef cattle fund. We've deployed over 100 million Australian dollars in equity and debt uh, and acquired over a million acres of land there. Uh, using a, a new uh, kind of grazing system, which I'll go through in more detail in the context of Chile. Um, we are also actually uh, launching a smaller 50 million euro forestry fund that will invest in Irish forestry, and that's already been, uh, we've received a commitment from the European Investment Bank, and we hope to get that going in the next three months. Uh, and then finally, we're raising uh, for a new sheep strategy in Chile, and that's what I'll go into in, in more detail 
later on in the webinar. Um, I just want to start by talking a little bit about definitions, you know, and, and what is, let's say, ecological and regenerative agriculture. Um, and I think that there are lots of different terms, uh, sub-branches, um, kind of subsets and overlapping uh, circles, you know, whether you, people talk about agroecology, people talk about biological farming, biodynamics, permaculture, organic, you know, the list goes on. Um, I think what, what ties a lot of this together is a few key principles. Um, so I think, first of all, it starts with a focus on soil health, you know, in particularly biologically active soil, and really understanding the interactions of, of microbes, of fungi, of earthworms, of insects, you know, and how you can let them do as much work as possible in providing nutrients for the plants that you're trying to grow. I think a second key principle which ties all these systems together is they try and minimize external inputs, uh, and that could be um, uh, fertilizer, it could be uh, agrochemicals, it could be feed in, in the case of animal system. And instead, you know, try to recycle um, uh, nutrients and, and make the most of what nature provides for free. Um, and in these kinds of systems, you know, there's really no waste, because if there's waste, you're doing something wrong. You, everything biologically that's been grown and produced should be recycled and reused somewhere in the system. Another principle, I think, is diversity. Um, and so there's been a trend in a lot of conventional industrial agriculture to simplify and specialize, um, to only grow one thing. And I think these kinds of systems actually embrace diversity of crops, of animals, um, uh, you know, putting trees into the mix as well, and really trying to uh, understand and exploit the synergies between different organisms in a farming system. And I think the final point is there is a focus in these systems of, of growing healthier, nutritious, higher quality food. So it's not just about quantity, but it is genuinely about quality and, um, and thinking about the consumer, what the consumer wants. Um, there's lots of different techniques which fall under, I think, the category of ecological regenerative agriculture. Uh, for example, reduces zero tillage, um, using more extended um, and complex crop rotations, uh, using cover crops so you don't have bare soil, you always have something growing in, on your fields all during the year. I'm trying to minimize or even completely eliminate agrochemicals, as I said, um, using compost uh, or other kinds of biological soil amendments to restore fertility and, and to get biological activity going in your soils. Something called integrated pest management, which is a again a way of, of weaning oneself off reliance on chemicals and instead using symbiotic species interactions to reduce pest uh, burdens. And mixing crops and livestock systems again, so we're rotating animals through uh, arable fields. Um, intensive rotational grazing of pastures or, or holistic plant grazing, that's something I'll talk a lot more about in the context of Chile. Uh, and then agroforestry, where you're mixing trees with crops or trees with animals. So, um, We think there's probably around 200 million hectares of land around the world using these kinds of techniques. That's probably about 5% of, of the um, agricultural um, uh, land in the world. So it's certainly not um, the mainstream, um, but we think it is growing quickly, and we think it has a lot further to go. Um, so why look at these more ecological farming systems? Well, I think the first point is you have to understand what are the risks of um, conventional industrial agriculture. Uh, and we think there's, there are a number, um, and they're often hidden, they're often misunderstood, and often not well priced into, into conventional tragedies. So I think the first is um, high input costs. Um, so conventional agriculture can be hugely dependent on fertilizer, on fossil fuels, on seeds, on feed. Um, and if you look what happened over the last 10, 15 years, so yes, we saw a big increase in food prices, but we saw an even quicker increase in the price of the inputs that the farmers have to buy. Uh, so a lot of the economic um, surplus from that era, high food prices, it wasn't going to the farmer. It was going to the companies producing the inputs, whether that's Monsanto or John Deere or, or, or Dow. You know, they tend to, to, to do well. You also find that um, although some of these prices are coming down now, they tend to lag. They tend to go up very quickly when food prices go up, but they tend to go down a lot more slowly, um, uh, and that can put a big strain on farmers' uh, uh, profitability. A second um, challenge of conventional systems is degrading natural assets. Uh, you know, soil erosion and soil degradation is, is one of the really biggest challenges we have all around the world, and it's not just some, a problem of the Saharan fringes or the rain-soaked hills of Central America. I mean, this is happening in the most advanced farming regions in the world. You know, so I've just 
shown an example here from Iowa um, in 2013, where there was a study done by the Environmental, Work, Environmental Working Group, and they found that um, in, in a quite short period of time, that these fields were losing 20 tons a hectare per hectare of soil in just five days, I mean, and that's that's an extraordinarily high soil erosion rate. So we see this problem everywhere, uh, where there is um, intensive farming going on. Just an even more stark example. This is a picture from Australia, shows the impact of gully erosion uh, on, on on farmland there. So there's examples from all around the world of this kind of uh, degradation. But it's not just soils. There's also overuse of water. Um, lists of environmental problems uh, emerging. Um, I think another big risk of conventional systems is vulnerability to extreme weather. You know, so I think everybody knows as the climate warms that we're going to get not only changes in averages but also um, increases in extremes. So more droughts, more floods, more heat waves. There's already evidence that's been happening. The Munich Re have a pretty comprehensive national database where they track uh, the, the stats on this. Uh, and they've shown that the um, frequency of these events has sort of doubled over the past 30 years. Um, another key risk, of course, of conventional farming is um, environmental externality. So, you know, farming can be a dirty business. Um, it can uh, spew out a, an awful lot of problems on the rest of society. Uh, this is particular example is it really focuses on water pollution and the nutrient overloading in the, the Mississippi River system. Uh, which has led to the creation of a 6,000 square dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, uh, and that's mostly coming uh, from runoff from uh, farmers' field, you know, all throughout the Mississippi uh, Basin. Um, but it, it's not just, it's not, of course, not just water, it's also um, climate. You know, so, uh, agriculture is responsible for probably 12 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions directly, 12 percent indirectly through land use change. Um, and so it is one of the biggest uh, sources of, of, of greenhouse gas emissions as well. So, um, and if you look at things like antibiotic overuse and, and how that leads to drug resistance, it, again, a long list of, of externalities um, associated with farming today. And just a, f a final point, and, and a major, I think, risk um, if, for conventional systems is shifting consumer trends. And a lot of people might, will have seen that ch famous Chipotle ad that came out um, a few years ago, uh, which is really trying to take a, a, a significant dig at conventional industrial um, animal systems and it had a big impact and you know a lot of consumer perception now there's a, a huge amount of concern about how food is produced a real desire to find healthier more nutritious more sustainable um, forms of food and, and a shift away from from kind of, you know commoditized cheapest um, uh, production you know with all the negative uh, impacts associated with that it's it's most strongly felt among young people you know it's if you look at all the studies of of a willingness to pay a premium for sustainable food. I mean, the irony is, is the is the youngest people who have the least amount of disposable income are most willing and able and, and to pay a premium for their food and, and to really care about where the food comes from. Whereas the older generations um, uh, are less concerned. So I think you know, as time goes by, we'll only see this this trend intensify. So I think overall, we say you know, a number of risks. Um, Around conventional agricultural systems, there's been a little bit of head in the sand amongst the, you say, the farming community really about this. So there's a sort of a hope that, you know, consumers um, are, are a sort of sense of consumers are a pesky irritant. They're maybe a little bit ignorant. Um, they don't really understand the true issues. If only they did, you know, they think differently. And let's just kind of produce and, and try and hide a little bit what we're doing in, in, a, in a fairly extended supply chain, um, and just sort of get on with it. And I think that's. You wouldn't see that attitude in any other industry. You can't imagine Apple or Unilever thinking about consumers in that way. You know, so we think that um, you know farming is going to have to to shift, you know, to come into line of what consumers want. So why go ecological and, and why embrace these more regenerative forms of agriculture? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that these ecological systems that I'm uh, talking about, you don't have to accept lower productivity or lower yields and actually a lot of the agroecological innovations that we've looked at and um, can lead to higher productivity uh, and there's a, a big study was done recently in the UK about this where they looked at, at 16 different or 15 different agroecological practices and they found that um, only two lowered productivity uh, you know anywhere. one was the same and another 13 were giving higher productivity so you, you actually can produce more food often by making these changes and embracing these more diverse, complex ecological um, systems. Another great advantage from an investment point of view is 
we also believe you can lower your operating costs. Um, just one example is from the Irish dairy um, industry, uh, that's my original home country, Ireland. Uh, and there's been a lot of research done to show that if you want to be profitable producing milk, you need to maximize your use of grass, of, of fresh uh, green uh, growing grass. Um, and once you, you know, once you get below a level of 80% or so, 75% of your feed coming from grass, if you're relying on, on the purchased concentrates to supply more than 20 or 30 percent, you're just not making money at the current milk price. You're in the red, uh, you're losing money, uh, and your business is severely stressed. So you, know, you minimize your operating costs by maximizing your use of what nature can give for free, and in this case it's green growing grass. Um, but we've seen examples of that not only in, in pasture-based systems, but also in, in cropping and, and, um, and permanent crops as well. So. Uh, because if you can, if you can take away the the fertilizer, take away the, the the fuel cost, take away the fee, take away the expensive seeds, yeah, you're going to bring down your cost base significantly. Um, another great advantage and and reason to pursue these kinds of systems is that they can take degraded land and and restore it and transform it, and, and, and thereby really enhance the natural capital base. Um, this, this is a well-known example from China, from the lowest plateau in China. And the photograph above shows the, the condition of that part of the world in, in 1995. You know, hugely graded, massive soil erosion, um, the land quite literally blowing away um, or flowing into the Yellow River. It was yellow, called it yellow for a reason. Um, there was a, a massive program of, of restoration uh, which was built on terracing, on the planting of trees, on controlled grazing uh, and on integration of, of, of cropping and grazing systems. And it has produced spectacular results. You know, and, and these these areas formerly barren and almost desert-like have literally been turned green, uh, creating lots of jobs and a lot more um, food being produced, uh, and really healing that land. And we've seen examples of that again all over um, the world, not just in developing countries but in developed countries as well. And I'll give you the example from Chile um, in a few minutes' time. Um, I think another reason why these kinds of systems have an attraction is they can be more resilient to extreme weather events. Uh, uh, this is a particular example from Indiana and USA, um, two fields side by side, or neighboring fields. If you look on the left, there's a conventional operator using minimum till for a very simplified crop rotation, um, probably just corn, soybeans uh, repeatedly. And on the right is a, um, is a completely no-till system which has been using cover crops for five years. And if you and you just look at the growth uh, of the soybean crop on the right and compared to the left, you can just see that farmer is going to have a much much better crop. And that's exactly the same rainfall, the same conditions. That's just because he's got healthier soil, effectively. Um, and a lot of this comes back. Um, and actually, if there's one thing that links not only climate resilience and climate and carbon and and, and, and everything else, it's it's uh, soil organic matter. You know, it's having healthy, well structured soils with high organic matter levels. That means that in the drought uh, times the land will hold water better. It also means when the floods come, the soil can soak up that water and instead of rushing off and taking all your soil with you. So so a healthy soil base is what's going to give you resilience to these uh, extremes. Um, I think another attraction of ecological farming systems is the ability to not just minimize the negative environmental impacts, but actually create some positive externalities and, and potentially even um, the ability to monetize them. Um, and, and you know, there's lots of examples of this, um, whether it's soil health, whether it's biodiversity, um, whether it's improved water uh, cycling and, and quality um, because of how we're managing, for example, our, our hillsides. Um, but I think maybe the, one of the biggest themes for the next few decades will be uh, carbon and climate change. Uh, and, and there is a great potential for agriculture uh, um, to actually not just um, reduce emissions, but actually to start sequestering carbon, putting carbon in soils, putting carbon in trees, putting carbon in biomass. Uh, you know, McKinsey with their famous uh, greenhouse gas abatement cost curve uh, a number of years ago identified agriculture as having some of the, the greatest potential uh, at the lowest cost to, to sequester uh, carbon, you know, and up to sort of five, close to five gigatons of CO2 per year. Um, and then there's other studies actually would indicate that the potential is much, much even higher than that. So, you know, I think there is opportunity for farmers to, to, to not just grow food and commodities, but also to become carbon farmers. Um, an example of the monetization of that. We've actually just been through it in our work in Australia with our Australia Fund. We uh, successfully <clears throat> bid into a reverse auction 
with the Australian Government's um, Emissions Reduction Fund, uh, which is a, a, a fund that has been set up to, um, to effectively buy carbon credits from farmers uh, you know, who are able to sequester carbon um, according to a certain approved methodologies. And we've, um, we've signed up to, to supply probably two million, in excess of two million tons of CO2 over the next uh, 10 years, and that's going to generate revenues of 15 to 20 million Australian dollars net uh, for that fund of the next 10 years. So, um, interesting when we spoke to investors, we always said that the environmental benefits and any environmental markets were pure upside. It was always assumed to be zero on the model. Um, and this is a nice example of how you know some things these upsides do actually happen, uh, and the market and policies uh, materialize, and you are able to monetize some of the positive impacts. Um, of course, another really important point is going back to what I said earlier about market shifts and consumer trends. Um, pursuing these more ecological and, and in many cases often organic systems does allow you to target those certain higher premium, higher value markets. Uh, and, you know, organic is the most developed, it's, it's the most um, strictly certified and therefore tends to generate the highest premiums. If you look at the current premiums in the US for corn, for example, there are massive premiums. Probably you can get three times the price for organic corn as conventional. You know? So that's having an enormous impact on the profitability of farmers at the moment. You know, now that corn price, the conventional corn prices have um, collapsed to the extent they have. Uh, we've seen the same in, in um, organic milk. Um, there's also some pretty large premiums available for grass-fed uh, meat and other grass-fed products. So these kind of premium markets um, we think are going to become even more and more attractive. Uh, and in a way it's also a risk mitigation point because if you don't um, produce in a sustainable ecological way you can't prove it, you risk being locked out of these markets and being really um, uh, confined to you know, the lowest value commodity markets. And so we think this is what um, investors and, and, and farmers should be uh, should be looking at. Um, but to tie it all together of course, you know, it, it has to come back to overall profitability and, and returns on the land and I, and I think there's plenty of evidence that it does actually, and that these ecological type of, of systems, um, for all the reasons that I've just given, can produce higher returns. Simple as that. Um, uh, there's a long-term research experiment at Iowa State University, uh, which has been running now for um, I think 10, 20 years. But they looked at data from 2006, 2010, comparing a conventional uh, corn soybean rotation with an organic um, uh, extended rotation, and they're finding that the organic system is producing. Um, Three hundred dollars per acre of profit versus less than a hundred for the conventional. So again, two to three times more profitable um, the organic system. Uh, just one more example. Again, looking at um, grass-fed dairy versus uh, confinement uh, systems, and you see that there's a thirty-five percent higher margin for the grass-based system in Wisconsin compared to the much more capital-intensive um, uh, large-scale confinement systems. Uh, so. Yeah, again, we've got a, a long list of case studies all pointing to the same conclusions that these kinds of systems, as well as reducing your risks um, around climate, environment, regulation, and consumer, can also actually just outperform and produce higher profits per, per acre or per hectare. Um, so I will pause there for a moment. Um, I think Olivia wanted to give people a chance to, to maybe put in some questions. So I'll, I'll pause there and turn over to Olivia. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Yes, so we have now reached the midpoint of our webinar. And for those of in the audience just tuning in, welcome. We're speaking with Paul McMahon from the investment management company SLM about the investment case for ecological and regenerative farming in the context of large scale landscape restoration. So far, Paul has provided a background on what ecological and regenerative farming is as well as made the business and environmental case for how these strategies can be um, a great option to restore degraded land. So Paul will now cover key insights on how to invest in ecological and regenerative farming. And we're also very excited to hear about one of his firm's new projects in degraded lands in the Chilean Patagonia, which also happens to be part of Initiative 20 times 20. Um, before we continue, we would also like to remind our listeners that questions are welcomed, as Paul just said, and we will be directing them to Paul at the conclusion of the talk. So please type them in the chat window. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Olivia. 
Yeah, and, I, and I just point out again that a lot of the material I'm covering in this section is available in the white paper we released in January, um, which is called The Investment Case for Ecological Farming, and it's available on our website. So you'll, you'll see plenty more detail there. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to go over a little bit about how then you can potentially invest in these kinds of strategies. If we, if we accept the argument that um, ecological farming systems of an, you know, can reduce risk and also produce a higher uh, returns you know, per acre per hectare than more conventional industrialized systems, you know, how do you turn that into an investment strategy? Um, and, and I think it, it's worth looking at the a very a simplified version of the, the farming supply chain and the food supply chain. Um, because there are different there are different parts in the supply chain in which you can play if you want to make investments. Uh, so if you sort of start on the left and look at the input and service providers, well actually a lot of the listed um, publicly listed companies active in agriculture, a lot of them are, are here, they're in that box. They're not actually farming companies, they're providers of inputs um, to farmers, you know, whether that's, that's machines, whether it's uh, feed or, or seed or fertilizers. Um, now we actually think that this isn't, this isn't really the place to focus if you're interested in, in, um, in backing ecological farming, largely because the whole point of ecological farming is to try and rely, reduce your reliance on those input providers. So now there are some um, specific examples of of, of, um, of manufacturers and providers of biological uh, inputs and biological soil amendments, which which are interesting, um, but they're they're fairly small scale. Um, so I actually think that the you know, the real shift um, is on the is on the land uh, the land piece. Uh, and actually, to, to go to the other end, you know, processors and traders, um, it's the same kind of um, the same kind of point. You know, you, you could invest in a a a, a branded food company, a a consumer facing food manufacturing company and there's some great examples of those um, and that can help to pu push back along the supply chain the right kind of signals for sure but you're not directly investing in that um, in the land uh, re uh, regeneration or the ecological farming system. If, if you look at the land and land ownership as that, as that middle box there's a few ways you can also invest in that theme and there's examples of all of these actually um, subcategories out there in the market at the moment a lot of money actually has flowed into agriculture over the last five ten years is focused on an, a buy and lease strategy so buying a farm and then leasing out to farmers again we don't think that's particularly well suited to a focus on ecological farming and mainly because you don't have a lot of control over how the farmer is, is using your land um, and actually if, if those uh, lease arrangements are not very carefully designed and monitored they can lead to uh, actually misalignment of incentives and um, where the, the, the person leasing the land actually has an incentive to in, in a way to mine the land uh, and to, to get as much short-term benefit as possible and not think long-term about the, the ecological health. Um, we think a, a more <clears throat> interesting place to um, to focus is in that own and partner, own and operate um, segment yeah, where investors through funds, through vehicles are, are acquiring land, maybe it's land which is somewhat degraded, somewhat poorly managed now, and then either um, uh, operating themselves uh, through um, in-house uh, management teams and that's the model we've used in Australia and we're planning to use in Chile or um, partnering with uh, other um, outside ecological farmers um, and that's probably going to be something which isn't a, as hands-off as a lease it, it's going to have um, it's going to be a much more active partnership uh, with probably more controls over the kinds of land management techniques that are being used and potentially some sharing of profit as well you know so that the um, that ecological farming partner really does have the same incentives as the investor in, in terms of uh, regenerating the ecological health of that land. Um, and then just finally, you know, another model is for people to invest just in the farm operator, just in the farmer, not on the land. And of course, that's capital light, um, you know, potentially higher returns. Um, but if you do that, um, again, you're not maybe getting the full, uh, not getting the full uplift in value that have been created by acquiring land and, and restoring and regenerating and, and really bringing about that, that ecological improvement. Yeah? So, so to really get the, the, the maximum control, the, the best alignment of incentives and get that full value uplift, we do think that you know, if possible some kind of control and ownership of the land should be part of, of the strategy. And, and then it falls into a real assets bucket and there's a lot of institutional investors out there at the moment who have a real desire for real assets that give that downside protection security while also generating income. And I think if you can put on top of that this ecological framework you, you have the potential to generate some really interesting um, strategies. <clears throat> However, you know, it's not, it's not easy um, and you know, my hopefully very convincing argument so far it probably left everyone wondering, well, if it's so wonderful and so easy, why isn't everyone doing it? 
And of course, the, the answer is it isn't always so easy. Um, the, these kinds of farming systems um, are often more complex, uh, the more knowledge intensive. Um, they're the very opposite of, of farming by numbers, which is what a lot of conventional farming has become, actually. Um, uh, and so you really need to find the right operation partners. Uh, you need to find um, people with a lot of uh, experience, a lot of skill, a lot of flexibility, and abil an ability to, to, to go from, the, um, from scientist to entrepreneur to, to marketeer to manager, you know, all, all in one person. The picture I put there is a Joel Salatin, one of the most famous ecological farmers in, in the U.S., and if not the world. You know, he's a great example of that, but it, it's hard to clone a, a Joel Salatin. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges for everybody working in space. How do you find those people? How do you partner with them? How do you build teams around them? How do you support them? Yeah? And, and that's uh, been a huge focus for us before we develop any of our investment strategies, is finding those great operation partners on the ground, close to the assets, who really understand the local, local markets and local ecologies. Um, a final point then is is the where to do it, the geographies, the countries. You know, I think there's there's opportunity everywhere. You know, there are, there are failing uh, conventional farming systems everywhere, and there's the opportunity to restore and improve and regenerate ecologically everywhere. Um, we as a firm have made a conscious decision to focus on more, let's say, developed, lower risk markets, um, which is why we're looking at places like Australia, uh, Chile, Ireland, and, and and North America in the future. Um, uh, because we, you know, farming agriculture is already quite a new sector for a lot of investors. Um, you, it takes a lot of education, and if you lay on top of that, then a lot of political risk and sovereign risk. Well, that that could just be too much and may scare people off. So we want to start in the simple geographies first. Um, um, but you know, it is possible to do it in, in more developing, more risky countries too. It, it just, I think, the return profile needs to look a bit different as well. Um, in terms of who's doing this already, uh, we put down just a name of, of a few companies that we're aware of uh, that we think are <clears throat> are supporting these kinds of ecological farming um, systems. It's not exhaustive, but these are the ones that we know. There's ourselves, of course. Um, there's a couple of groups in North America who are doing organic uh, farm and conversion. There's a couple of, of agroforestry and, and forestry-related funds who are really focusing on that developing country at the deforestation problem. A smaller group in New Zealand, and, and there's actually an interesting private equity fund called SGD Ventures, who are actually investing all along the supply chain, not so much in land, but at, at, at those different boxes that I mentioned before. If you total up it all up, that group probably has over half a billion dollars in assets under management. Now that's pretty small in in the context of some of the bigger ag investment managers and, and or timber investment managers that are out there, um, but it's not insignificant, and it is growing. And so we think this is a a, a subsector which is is going to grow strongly. Um, I'm, what I'm going I'm to shift gears a little bit now uh, and drill down into a particular strategy that we are developing in Chile, in South America, uh, which is focused on sheep production. And I think it, it hopefully will um, highlight a lot of the, the themes which I've, I've, um, I've uh, spoken about so far. So this is where we are, um, are working. This is the, uh, the southernmost tip. Of, of Chile, the Patagonian region, uh, or regions 12, which is Magallanes, and region 11, which is Aysen, primarily. It's a beautiful part of the world, you know, spectacular scenery, great fishing, um, you know, famous for that, uh, rich uh, local culture. Um, has a long tradition of sheep production, going back probably about 140 years now. And, you know, big extensive grasslands, in particular in, in the south of Magallanes, so it's, it's a kind of a steppe grassland uh, ecology in large areas. And it has some really good um, conditions for, for raising sheep, you know, so there, there's about 4 million hectares of grassland, about twice the size of New Jersey. Um, the rainfall in the south in particular is not particularly high, but it is consistent and reliable, which is the key thing for, uh, for grass uh, production. And the temperatures are not so extreme because of the maritime influence. Um, there is a well-developed supply chain uh, for sheep, um, including uh, slaughter plants in, in the south and in Coyhaique and Puerto Montt. Uh, there's different wool buying companies. There's even a large wool processing factory in Punta Arenas in the south. Uh, you know, there's, there's good transfer infrastructure. Um, the operating costs are relatively low, and because of its relative isolation where it is, it tends to be quite disease-free, uh, and, and that, that's a big bonus when you're managing um, and livestock. So it has a lot of really good conditions for sheep. It's very export focused. Most of its uh, meat and wool um, uh, product is exported uh, to world markets. Uh, it's been doing it for over 100 years. So lots of good sort of positives um, in its favor. However, 
um, there is a big but. Um, and and the, the problem is that line degradation it, it is a, a serious issue and a serious constraint on production in that part of the world. Um, it's, it's estimated about 90% of soils in Patagonia, and that's Chile and, Ar and Argentina, are degraded, and about a third are at risk of desertification. And this picture shows you what that looks like. You know, looking down, you'll have you know, isolated grasslands, lots of bare soil. Wherever you see bare soil, um, you have a problem um, because you're having you're getting dead soils, you're getting erosion, you're getting capping, and that's not a very biologically uh, functional um, uh, piece of land. And there is a way to reverse it, it's something called holistic plant grazing, also known as intensive rotational grazing or, or multi paddock grazing, often associated with a, a man called Alan Savory, um, uh, and, uh, but I think it's been taken on and implemented now by many thousands of people around the world. The, the simple idea is to take land which it's typically managed using continuous grazing, so, so that part of Chile, the, the typical model is you have big, big, big paddocks or fields, you have a few sheep in every paddock for all year or half the year, and they never move, and they overgraze the good grasses, um, uh, which get selected out of the ecosystem, they tramp, they compact the soils, uh, they, they, they really you know, degrade the, the pastures. Um, what illicit plant grazing tries to do is, is mimic nature and mimic behavior of, of wild uh, herds and wild flocks in nature. When because of predators and because of herding uh, and mobbing uh, behavior, you have big numbers of animals passing through and having large impacts on land, but then moving on again and giving land time to recover. Now we do that not by bringing back predators, but by dividing the land up into smaller paddocks using uh, fencing, electric fencing, putting sheep in much bigger flocks, and then moving them according to a planned um, uh, according to a planned grazing uh, system. Uh, so we're trying to give a lot, the grasslands a lot of impact, maybe for uh, one or two or three days, but then the plants may have months to recover, you know, and that's the key. And if you get that balance right, you can get a, a real recovery of the grasslands and the pastures. It can allow you to double or triple the carrying capacity, so two or three times more animals, and will also reduce your cost of production. It does need a little bit of capex on fencing water, and does require skill management. But there's no real inputs. You know, once you put in place the infrastructure, you're not really spending any money on, on fertilizers or seeds or irrigation or anything like that. Um, and, and that's what drives some really interesting economic results. And it's been used probably around 20 million hectares of land worldwide. Uh, it's the system we use in Australia, and that's how we, we got to learn about what's happening in Chile. Uh, but there's case studies all over the world of this system in place. And there's a great TED talk by Alan Savory two or three years ago, which really brought this to attention, um, which you can see. Um, just a few photographs of what this looks like in practice in Chile and Patagonia. So again, you know, big, uh, big flocks of sheep, um, lots of sheep, as you can see, you know, together uh, being moved according according to plans. Um, and in terms of what's being achieved, there's some there's some really great case studies to what's of results over the last ten years. Uh, that top picture, the the property on the left, uh, you can see, and then the neighboring property is on the right. Um, the neighboring property on the right, without much grass, is being managed conventionally using a conventional um, uh, sheep management system. The property on the left is being, is being managed using illicit plant grazing only for two or three years. And you can just see the amount of extra grass, the, healthy, the health of the soils and the grass plants on the left. And what's interesting, there are probably twice as many sheep on the property on the left using the grazing system than on the property on the right. So you're not sacrificing production, you're actually getting twice as much production and also a really impressive environmental and ecological result. Um, the pictures below are, are really a, a microcosm of the same process, taking land which was um, degraded, uh, often bare, uh, and by using the animals as a tool, you're getting a lot more grass plants, a lot more vigorous growth, filling in the gaps, um, and getting healthier pastures. Uh, there is another part of our strategy in Chile, so the first part is um, taking land, implementing the holistic plant grazing system. The second part is improving the genetics of the sheep through a breeding program, and that's um, crossing the local uh, female sheep with a, a uh, an Australian breed called multipurpose merinos, and they've been bred to produce good meat and wool, um, and if you cross those rams with the local ewes, you get some really impressive improvements in productivity, so you, you can produce a fine wool instead of a coarse wool, which is worth a lot more. Uh, you can get more wool, you can have higher lambing rates and, and heavier lambs. Um, and we like to say that the illicit plant grazing we can allows us to double the number of animals per hectare. Well, these better quality sheep allows us to double the profitability per sheep. So you're quadrupling your profit per hectare overall. Um, 
how do we know it works? Uh, why are we doing it in Chile? Well, one of the reasons is that we found a great operation partner, Jose Manuel Gortazar, who's been doing exactly this for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, he, and that's uh, Jose Manuel with his wife, who uh, is uh, from New Zealand, Lizzie. Um, he has introduced illicit bank raising since 2008. He's worked with almost 30 properties in Chile and several in the Falkland Islands, over half a million hectares, uh, and has collected great data on that. And, and they've achieved, on average, a tripling of grass production across the properties you know, within three to four years, in many cases. And he spent even longer working on the sheep um, breeding um, through his company, Obitec, and he's worked with probably a 20% of the sheep flock in, in the Magallanes region already uh, by helping to improve quality. And again, some great data on the, on the impacts on, on profitability uh, of that work. So he's done this before. He owns his own thousand hectare property. Um, you know, it was really because of him and through meeting him, we were able to build a strategy and build a team uh, and make what we think is a, a very interesting investable strategy. And just quickly, what we're planning to do, raise um, about 100 million US dollars we're looking to acquire farmland in Patagonia, Chile, mostly Magallanes and Aysen. Uh, two parts then to the strategy. One is introducing the holistic plant grazing system, and the other is the multipurpose marine and breeding program. Um, we'll, we're focusing on sheep production from meat and wool. The revenues will be close to 50-50 meat and wool, most of which will go uh, for export into world markets. Um, this is what you would call a buy and operate strategy in the SLM will We'll, we'll acquire the land we'll, and we'll operate the land, and although, you know, of course, hiring local people and staff for each property. Um, and then we'll look to get these productivity improvements to the better quality sheep and to the higher carrying capacities um, and sell into the existing supply chain. Um, but where possible, we will look into those premium markets, and you know, whether that's, that's sustainable wool, whether it's organic or grass fed, you know, something that we will uh, step into you know, over time. And, and the goal is to, is to deliver a, a um, a uh, you know a 10 to 15 year strategy, a, a steady stream of income to investors um, during that period, uh, while also um, looking to improve the, the value of the of the, the land, you know, and the, the capital base uh, underpinning it. And um, we also want to deliver some um, uh, important and measurable environmental impacts. Uh, and really, again, this isn't an add-on. This isn't a you know, what you often do the last slide in the presentation, a, a bit of greenwash, is actually the ecological strategy which underpins the financial performance. So it's the other way around. It's, it's by working with nature, understanding ecology, applying this kind of farming system that allows us to deliver those financial returns. Um, one thing we're fortunate is that a lot of work has been done uh, to develop a, a monitoring protocol, and that's been done by uh, a local group called Ovis 21 and the Nature Conservancy. So and they developed something called the GRASS protocol. Grassland regeneration sustainable standard for Patagonia and grasslands, uh, and that measures uh, impacts on grasses and erosion and water cycles, nutrients, wildlife, uh, and also soil carbon. And that's something that we will apply, we will measure, we will rep we will report on uh, to investors each year. Um, and just finally, uh, we are part of something called the 2020 Initiative, um, uh, and what that is is a a a partnership which aims to restore 20 million hectares of land in Latin America by 2020. And you'll see that a lot of countries in, in South and Central America have signed up to it and made various commitments um, uh, over the past couple of years. It's coordinated by the World Resources Institute, the WRI in Washington. Um, and I think what's interesting about it is that it's, it's not, it's, um, although governments are very much involved, the, the engine really for the land restoration is going to be impact investors. And so there's nine different impact investment groups or, or management teams which have um, made commitments to raise and or deploy capital on various strategies you know, in that region. I'd say most of them are focused on forestry, you know, um, in the tropical areas. Uh, and there's some really interesting strategies around that um, in that list. We are probably the only group really looking at grasslands in that more temperate zone, that makes it a little bit different. Um, but I think it's all very complementary, and, and I think it's a good example of how you, you, we can create these sort of public-private and NGO partnerships um, to, to try and you know get the right sort of government support to get you know financial capital, investment capital as the as a real engine driver of change, um, while also having some of the NGO involvement to help um, to smooth the path, let's say, you know, and create that enabling environment. And I know the WRI are also working with the 
um, Inter-American Development Bank and CAF and you can talk to USAID about potentially developing some risk mitigation mechanisms or which would in effect uh, tip the risk return profile a little bit more in favor of investors and, and therefore allow these teams to, to raise capital. I don't think we really need that for Chile because it's already a low risk country. I think some of those other strategies you know, um, it could be very useful for them uh, when you're operating in slightly riskier uh, geographies. So um, I will end on, so there's a sort of bigger picture note of what we're trying to do with all this, which is really trying to look back at the history of agriculture and, and what's the future of agriculture, you know, and, and, and if you go back and you look over the last 100, 200 years, you know, at the different revolutions in agriculture, well first we had the mechanical revolution, you know, so all the you know, tractors and Threshers and reapers and, and all these big machines that really took labor um, uh, out of agriculture and, and allowed us to produce an awful lot more. And then we had the chemical revolution you know, over the last sort of 80 years and um, you know, coming off the, out of the First World War, the Haber-Bosch process, fertilizers and agrochemicals, in which allowed us to, when combined with high yield ECs, to produce even more per hectare um, and really pump up yields. But I do think we're on the brink of what we call the biological revolution. You know, that you know, people are seeing um, some of the challenges and limitations of those those chemical approaches. Uh, we're seeing some of the unintended um, spillover effects, you know, on the wider environment. And I think we're only now beginning to understand um, the potential to harness biology and ecology, you know, to produce food um, that we need while also having positive impacts on the environment. And this is very science-based. You know, it's not sort of loosey-goosey. Um, you know, hippie-oriented um, um, kind of pie-in-the-sky thinking. This is very much based on the latest good in science around the roles of, of um, microorganisms, of microbes, and of what's happening in the soil, the species interaction. It's real cutting edge science, um, and it's, it's underpinning, we think, this revolution, you know, and that we believe in 20 years' time, farming will look very different from uh, how it looks today. But thank you. I will uh, finish there. Um, as I said, we, we have produced a white paper on this topic, uh, which you can download from our website, and that's my email if you do want to follow up with any uh, specific questions. Uh, but I think we will now be opening the forum to questions in any case, so I'll, I'll try and address them now if I can. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for the talk. So, good news. The presentation has inspired several questions from the audience and colleagues so far, and we would love to get your input on these. And for the rest of the audience, again, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat window, in the GoToWebinar chat window. So um, we were wondering, in the Irish dairy example, the y-axis showed costs and excluded specifically, specifically excluded labor. So going to your point about regenerative farming techniques being knowledge intensive, could you talk about whether that imposes significant costs relative to conventional agriculture, and what are the ways to circumvent this knowledge limitation? Sure. No, it's a great question. Well, and just point out that the Irish dairy example did include labor costs. So all the costs are factored into that that um, y-axis. So it is the true cost of the different systems. Um, but I think we, that the question does get at a, a really good point that in some cases these ecological systems, let's say more organic systems, yeah, they can be more labor intensive. And that has been one of the things which has been dragging them down and can drag them down um, uh, in, in economic terms and also in way in lifestyle terms. You know, and anyone who spent, you know, half a day hand weeding carrots in an organic field will know that it's it's pretty tedious and backbreaking work. Um, you know, having said that, you know, I think it isn't always the case, um, and I think that, you know, all, all the examples that we have found, all the case studies we're interested in, you know, they all come out net net um, as, as being more profitable. You know, even even if they may have slightly higher labor costs, because you're saving so much on the other aspects, on the on the input side and the, on the capital side, that you're still coming out with a better result. There's of course a whole other school um, of thought that you know having those higher labor costs is actually a, a really positive thing because it means you're employing more people. You know, and, and if you, um, if you go to Joe Salton's farm in Virginia, you know he's got dozens of people working there on all these stacked enterprises. There's a it's another um, uh, pasture-based system in, uh, I think, in Georgia, White Oak Pastures, and, and they, they employ 150 people. You know, they effectively revitalized a, a rural community that had completely died off, and you know, housing people and, and really you know, building a village back. So I think in a, you know, in a world of um, of of, uh, of of late of you know, where work is scarce and, and, and maybe not so satisfying, not so well paid, the, the ability to be able to to um, to employ more people in, in these you know, more value-add systems, I think, could be quite attractive. 
Um, I think that the skill and, and the challenge remains, um, and it is probably the most difficult thing to solve for it, you know, because um, uh, you know a lot of the sort of best and brightest were kind of pulled away from agriculture and farming you know, for the last 50, 100 years. You know? um, it wasn't seen as a very attractive profession to be in, and, and I think that is changing, and probably needs to continue to change. That people see these these ecological farmers as being, you know, just as respected and you know just as high tech, let's say, as a you know, as a computer engineer or, or, or anyone else, you know, that this is really, this is real science-based, cutting-edge and challenging um, work, you know, and, and but therefore it should be quite attractive too. Great. Um, yeah, that, that addresses also a lot of other questions that are um, coming in, which are basically focused around the social dimensions and considerations of these types of investment models. So you mentioned uh, Jose Manuel's role. We're also wondering what happens to existing farmers or herders when you acquire so many millions um, hectares of land. What role do local stakeholders play in the process? And especially, spe especially given we're talking about really large areas that are to be restored. Sure. Yeah. No. Uh, you know, another great question which we always get. Um, and so you know, we are hugely aware and sensitive of all the issues around land grabs, and actually in the book I published a few years ago, there's a whole chapter on land grabs, so we're very much aware of the, um, the negative impacts you can have as, as sort of foreign investors coming in, so particular to developing uh, countries um, where people rely on agriculture and, 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 and land, you know, for the livelihoods, and acquiring land, pushing people off and, and switching to some kind of com you know, commercial corporate farming system. That is not something we want to do. I don't think it's I don't think it's I don't think it's ethically right. But also, I also think they're terrible investments, um, and most of them have gone badly wrong actually in sub-Saharan Africa and other regions. Um, it's another it's one of the reasons why we have focus on let's say more developed OECD countries, where in a way you know that transition from from the, the rural areas to cities has already happened. You know, and and actually rural areas are suffering from depopulation, and people are um, you know and and, and also where average age of farmers is often extremely high. You know, whether, and you look at Australia, the US, the average age of farmers is 58 to 60. In the case of Australia, most of the land we have purchased has come from people in their 60s and 70s, even their early 80s. Uh, and their children have grown up, they've gone to university, they've got moved to the cities, they don't want to come back. So it's a succession issue. It's effectively a retirement issue for a lot of the people there. So there is there is already happening, and there will even be more be, a, a, a generational shift in, in land ownership. Um, as th that last generation, um, who were still kind of within touching distance of the time when half the people did live in, in rural areas, you know, that last generation is starting to get to an age where they just can't manage the land anymore. So I think that shift to slightly different ownership models you know, is a natural response to that. Um, another factor in Chile, again, you know, where we are buying, they are all commercial, large-scale operations already. Um, most of them would be absentee owned, often by people in Santiago or other parts of Chile. So a change of ownership doesn't really make any big difference really to the local people on the ground. And we had to believe that by bringing in a more regenerative, more ecological, more um, uh, successful uh, land management system, we can help also revitalize those communities because we're going to bring more jobs, we're going to hire more people, um, we're going to be putting more money into those economies. and we're, we're going to reverse what's been a really long run degradation of those regions, you know, where they actually their peak sheep numbers in in Patagonia was in 19, I think, late 1950s, where there were twice as many sheep as there are now, you know, and a lot of that's because of the degradation of the land since then. So we can reverse that. We can increase sheep numbers. We can get employ more people. We can have more jobs. We have more money flowing through those those local communities. I think that will that will largely be a positive. We're also training people and and building up the skill base in these uh, management systems. Great. Um, another question that we have is that although the investment projects aim for sustainable food and positive environmental effects, um, what are the actual impacts on food on local food prices? Um, what is the effect of this ecological agricultural model for the global food market and prices, and is it scalable? Okay. So, well, I think um, there's two ways to tackle that. So, I think you know the. the so ecological farming as a whole, as I was saying, you know, there's there's examples of that in all kinds of countries, from poor to rich, you know, from large scale to small scale. So I think it's, you know, and so I think 
as part of a, as a solution to the food security challenges in poor developing countries where most people do rely on, on land and agriculture for the livelihoods, you know, these ecological, agroecological systems are absolutely the answer, you know, and they should be focused on smallholder production and, and, they, and they can help produce more food, which is going to be really good for uh, food security in those countries more broadly, while also serving as an engine for rural economic development in those countries too. Yeah? So I think that's the first point generally. In our, our particular strategies, um, you know, we focus in on those, again, more developed countries, which are already very export focused. You know, so in Australia, two thirds of its beef production is exported. Um, in Chile, probably more like three quarters of all the sheep production is exported. So to be honest, you know, what we're doing will have a huge impact on local food prices. Um, it, it will hopefully, in global terms, though, we are trying to, again, try and be part of the solution to the broader food security challenge of the world. Where we're trying to produce more food, better quality food, in ways that don't destroy the land, but actually restore it. So I hope that we're making a contribution to that much bigger uh, global picture. Great. So in order to reach scale, the scale we just talked about, with financing and investment, risk mitigation is crucial. And you briefly touched on this at the end of your presentation when you mentioned the other investment companies that were working on this. So what specific mechanisms are in place to address the risks of land restoration schemes in general and in Chile specifically? Um. Yeah, so and I, I, I just realized I forgot actually that, that last part of that que last question about scalability, is it scalable? And this kind of gets to this as well. I think the answer is absolutely yes. So all the things we're doing and all the things we're looking at are are at a large scale, you know, $100 million plus projects. So absolutely this is scalable. I think that's the first point. Um, y y your question about risk mitigation, um, it, it, I think it depends a little bit on, on the where as well as the what, you know, what you're investing in. I actually, I actually think that our strategies that we're developing don't actually require, you know, external risk mitigation mechanism. You know, we, we feel that our strategies stand on their own two feet, as I said at the beginning, and that the economic logic is so compelling and the, the you know, the risks are manageable that it's just a, a really in, interesting proposition in and on itself and doesn't rely on cheap capital or, or guarantees or anything else. Now, for some of those other um, participants in that 2020 initiative who were working in in more um, risky geographies and working on in tropical forest uh, communities and working with smallholders, you know, completely completely different models. Yeah, I think absolutely that's where the risk really comes to the fore. You know, and whether it's currency risk, whether it's it's sovereign political risk, whether it's you know execution risk, because again, you know, you're working with you know hundreds of thousands of smallholders, very high transaction costs. Um, maybe some of those strategies rely on carbon markets or carbon payments as well. That's the policy risk. So there's a number of risks. Um, the mechanisms that uh, are being worked on through that initiative are a, I think there's an idea for a first loss facility, effectively some kind of guarantee mechanism whereby the IADB or Inter-American Development Bank or other multilaterals would step in and effectively provide a, a, a guarantee that, that they would take the first 10 or 20 percent of losses, let's say, in the event that a project goes wrong. Yeah? So, and, and, and that kind of thing could just tip again that balance a risk return um, calculation for, for investors to come in. Others um, sort of go back and look at the source of capitals. I know some of the schemes you see will try and uh, target um, cheap sources of capital, which effectively subsidize you know, the, the purely commercial capital. So, for example, the Alcelia Fund, they've, I think, got a relatively low cost uh, loan from uh, USAID, um, and that effectively is, 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 um, is going to increase returns for the, the, the pure private um, equity holders, yeah? Um, so, so that's sort of using different forms of capital to, to, to sort of to shift the risk return profile, you know, uh, in the capital structure. So lots, there are different ideas out there, all of which have been used in various forms, um, and, but I think it really depends on the, the where and the what of your investing and you know, how necessary they are. Great, and we have time for one last question. Could you clarify if SLM has any operations here in North America? And if so, what size of land parcels fits um, fit within SLM strategy? Uh, so we don't have any um, active strategies in North America at the moment. It is our plan in the second half of the year to work on that. We do have a number of ideas, um, which I won't go through now. So that is definitely sort of next on our list you know, uh, to explore. Uh, in terms of size, we don't really think in terms of land parcels. It's probably more because of how much money we can deploy. We're probably looking for strategies where you can deploy a minimum 
100 million dollars, let's say. Yeah? Um, but but you know, in terms of how much land that might involve, it really depends. If you're talking extensive ranch lands, it could be very big. If you're talking about intensive, high-value, I don't know, permanent crop land, it could be quite quite small. So it's more the the size investment that, that drives it. Great. Thank you very much, Paul, for this very insightful presentation. So that concludes today's talk on large-scale landscape restoration, the investment case for ecological and regenerative farming. If you wish to view a recording of this webinar, please visit the CBay website or access the recording through YouTube or Yale iTunes. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next time, this is Olivia Sanchez from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. Thank you.